In this video, we're going to go through the usages of a namespace and the best practices of when and how to use a namespace. First of all, what is a namespace in Kubernetes? In Kubernetes cluster, you can organize resources in namespaces. So you can have multiple namespaces in a cluster. You can think of a namespace as a virtual cluster inside of a Kubernetes cluster. Now, when you create a cluster, by default, Kubernetes gives you namespaces out of the box. So in the command line, if I type kubectl get namespaces, I see the list of those out of the box namespaces that Kubernetes offers. And let's go through them one by one. The Kubernetes dashboard namespace is shipped automatically in Minikube. So it's specific to Minikube installation. You will not have this in a standard cluster. The first one is Kube system. Kube system namespace is not meant for your use. So basically you shouldn't create anything or shouldn't modify anything in Kube system namespace. The components that are deployed in the namespace are the system processes. Uh, they're from master managing processes or kubectl, etc. The next one is kube public. And what kube public contains is basically the publicly accessible data. It has a config map that contains cluster information, which is accessible even without authentication. So if I type here kubectl cluster info, this is the output that I get through that um, information. And the third one is kube node lease, which is actually a recent addition to Kubernetes. And the purpose of that namespace is that it holds information about the heartbeats of nodes. So each node basically gets its own object that contains the information about that node's availability. And the fourth namespace is the default namespace. And default namespace is the one that you're going to be using to create the resources at the beginning if you haven't created a new namespace. But of course, you can add and create new namespaces. And the way that you can do it is using kubectl create namespace command with the name of the namespace. So I can create my namespace. And if I do kubectl get namespaces, I see that in my list now. Another way to create namespaces is using a namespace configuration file, which I think is a better way to create namespaces because you also have a history um, in your configuration file repository of what resources you created in the cluster. Okay, so now we saw what namespaces are and um, that you can create new ones and that Kubernetes offers some of them by default. But the question is, what is the need for namespaces? When should you create them and how you should use them? And the first use case of using or creating your own namespaces is the following. Imagine you have only default namespace, which is provided by Kubernetes, and you create all your resources in that default namespace. If you have a complex application that has multiple deployments, which create replicas of many pods, and you have resources like services and config maps, etc., very soon your default namespace is going to be filled with different components. And it will be really difficult to have an overview of what's in there, especially if we have multiple users creating stuff inside. So a better way to use namespaces in this case is to group resources into namespaces. So for example, you can have a database namespace where you deploy your database and all its required resources. And you can have a monitoring namespace where you deploy the Prometheus and all the stuff that it needs. You can also have Elasticsearch namespace where all the Elasticsearch, Kibana, etc. resources go and you can have Nginx ingress resources. So just one way of logically grouping your resources inside of the cluster. Now, according to the official documentation of Kubernetes, you shouldn't use namespaces if you have smaller projects and up to 10 users. I personally think that it's always a good idea to group your resources in namespaces because, as I said, even if you have a small project and 10 users, you might still need some additional resources for your application, like, you know, logging system and monitoring system. And even with a minimum setup, you can already get too much 
to just throw everything in a default namespace. Another use case where you will need to use namespaces if you have multiple teams. So imagine this scenario, you have two teams that use the same cluster. And one team deploys uh, an application which is called my app deployment. That's the name of the deployment they create. And that deployment has its certain configuration. Now, if another team had a deployment that accidentally had the same name, but a different configuration, and they created the deployment or they applied it, they would overwrite the first team's deployment. And if they're using, for example, a Jenkins or some automated way to deploy those, um, that application or to create that deployment, they wouldn't even know that they overwrote or disrupted another team's deployment. So to avoid such kind of conflicts, again, you can use namespaces so that each team can work in their own namespace without disrupting the other. Another use case for using namespaces is, let's say you have one cluster and you want to host both staging and development environment in the same cluster. And the reason for that is that, for example, if you're using something like Nginx controller or Elasticsec used for logging, for example, you can deploy it in one cluster and use it for both environments. In that way, you don't have to deploy these common resources twice in two different clusters. So now the staging can use both resources as well as the development environment. Another use case for using namespaces is when you use blue green deployment for your application, which means that in the same cluster, you want to have two different versions of production. So the one that is active, that is in production now, and another one that is going to be the next production version. The versions of the applications in those blue and green production namespaces will be different. However, the same as we saw before in staging and development, these namespaces might need to use the same resources, like again, Nginx controller or Elastic Stack. And this way, again, they can both use this common shared resources without having to set up a separate cluster. So one more use case for using namespaces is to limit the resources and access to namespaces when you're working with multiple teams. So again, we have a scenario where we have two teams working in the same cluster and each one of them has their own namespace. So what you can do in this scenario is that you can give the teams access to only their namespace. So they can only be able to create, update, delete resources in their own namespace, but they can't do anything in the other namespaces. In this way, you even restrict or even minimize the risk of one team accidentally interfering with another team's work. So each one has their own secured, isolated environment. Additional thing that you can do on a namespace level is limit the resources that each namespace consumes. Because if you have a cluster with limited resources, you want to give each team a share of resources for their application. So if one team, let's say, consumes too much resources, then other teams will eventually have much less and their applications may not schedule because the cluster will run out of the resources. So what you can do is that per namespace, you can define resource quotas that limit how much CPU, RAM, storage resources one namespace can use. So I hope walking through these scenarios helped you analyze in which use cases and how you should use namespaces in your specific project. There are several characteristics that you should consider before deciding how to group and how to use namespaces. The first one is that you can't access most of the resources from another namespace. So for example, if you have a configuration map in project A namespace that references the database service, you can't use that config map in project B namespace, but instead you will have to create the same config map that also references the database service. So each namespace will define or must define its own config map, even if it's the same reference. And the same applies to secret. So for example, if you have credentials of a shared service, you will have to create that secret in each namespace where you are going to need that. 
However, a resource that you can share across namespaces is a service. And that's what we saw in the previous slide. So config map in project B namespace references service that is going to be used eventually in a pod. And the way it works is that in a config map definition, the database URL, in addition to its name, which is MySQL service, will have a namespace at the end. So using that URL, you can actually access services from other namespaces, which is a very practical thing. And this is how you can actually use shared resources like Elasticsearch or Nginx from other namespaces. And one more characteristic is that we saw that most of the components resources can be created uh, within a namespace, but there are some components in Kubernetes, they're not namespaced, so to say. Um, so basically they live just globally in the cluster and you can't isolate them or put them in a certain namespace. And examples of such resources are volume or persistent volume and node. So basically when you create the volume, it's gonna be accessible throughout the whole cluster uh, because it's not in a namespace. And you can actually list components. They're not bound to a namespace using a command kubectl api resources dash dash namespaced false. And the same way you can also list all the resources that are bound to a namespace using namespace true. So now that you've learned what the namespaces are, why to use them, in which cases it makes sense to use them in which way, and also some characteristics that you should consider, um, let's actually see how to create components in a namespace. In the last example, and also if you've seen my previous videos, um, we've created components using configuration files and nowhere there we have defined a namespace. So what happens is by default, if you don't provide a namespace to a component, it creates them in a default namespace. So if I apply this config map component, and let's do that actually right now, so kubectl apply minus f config map. If I apply that and I do kubectl get config map, my config map was created in a default namespace. And notice that even in the kubectl get config map command, I didn't use a namespace because kubectl get or kubectl commands, they take the default namespace as a default. So kubectl get config map is actually same as kubectl get config map dash n or namespace and default namespace. So these are the same commands, it's just a shortcut because it takes default as a default namespace. Okay, so one way that I can create this config map in a specific namespace is using kubectl apply command, but adding a flag namespace and the namespace name. So this will create config map in my namespace. And this is one way to do it. Another way is inside the configuration file itself. So I can adjust this config map configuration file to include the information about the destination namespace itself. So in the metadata, I can add a namespace attribute. So if I apply this configuration file again using kubectl apply, and now if I want to get the component that I created in this specific namespace, then I have to add the option or the flag to kubectl get command because as I said, by default, it will check only in the default namespace. So I recommend using the namespace attribute in a configuration file instead of providing it to the kubectl command, uh, because one, it's, it's better documented. So you know, by just looking at the configuration file, where the component is getting created, because that could be an important information. And second, if you're using automated deployment where you're just applying the configuration files, then again, this will be a more convenient way to do it. Now, if for example, we take a scenario where one team gets their own namespace and they has to uh, work entirely in the namespace, it could be pretty annoying to have to add this namespace tag to every kubectl command. So in order to make it more convenient, there is a way to change this default or active namespace, which is default namespace to whatever namespace you choose. And Kubernetes or kubectl doesn't have any out of the box solution for that, but there's a tool called kubeNS or kubens, and you have to install the tool. So on Mac, so I'm gonna execute brew install kubectx. So this will install 
Cubens tool as well. So once I have the Cubens installed, I can just execute Cubens command. And this will give me a list of all the namespaces and highlight the one that is active, which is default right now. And if I want to change the active namespace, I can do Cubens my namespace. And this will switch the active namespace. So if I do cube ends now, I see that active one is my namespace. So now I can execute kubectl commands without providing my namespace namespace. But obviously, if you switch a lot between the namespaces, this will not be so much um, convenient. For your own operating system and environment, there will be a different installation process. So I'm going to link the kubectx installation guide in the description below. Thanks for watching the video. I hope it was helpful and if it was, don't forget to like it. If you want to be notified whenever a new video comes out, then subscribe to my channel. Um, if you have any questions, if something wasn't clear in the video, please post them in the comment section below and I will try to answer them. So thank you and see you in the next video.